This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, my guest today, Laura Boyd, has long had an interest in travel, adventure, and natural history, which steered her to the path of documentary filmmaking. She spent nearly a decade traveling the globe while working for natural history and expedition travel companies, serving in the roles of cruise director and expedition leader for the company Society Expeditions. Laura traveled to Alaska and the Russian Far East, Polynesia, Chile, Argentina, the Falkland Islands, South Georgia, and Antarctica. A brief stint working for IMAX convinced her to pursue an MFA in science and natural history filmmaking at Montana State University. When, after her first week of class was spent filming bison in Yellowstone National Park, she knew she'd found her bliss. She was subsequently hired by National Geographic and produced content for National Geographic Channel, National Geographic Mission Programs, National Geographic Explorer, Wild Chronicles for PBS, and the award-winning children's television series Wild Detectives. In 2011, she joined the faculty right here at Point Park University to begin the next phase of her career in the cinema program. As an associate professor, Laura oversees the production concentration and teaches as many documentary classes as possible. So it's a real joy for to me, for me personally, to have my good friend Laura Boyd as my guest on Story Beat today. Laura, welcome. Thanks so much, Steve. Great to be here. <laughs> what were your earliest inspirations and influences? What got you uh, into this thing called art? Oh, wow. Um... As a child, um, I loved the natural world. I loved animals. I loved being outside and exploring. And um, you like digging in the dirt. I digging imagine. in the dirt, um, bringing frogs home. Worms. Any, lots of worms. <laughs> any? No, not worms so much as as little creatures. Um, and my parents encouraged it. My parents were really supportive. Um, and one of my earliest memories of, of a, uh, being inspired to take photographs is I took some photographs of some frogs, and my father was very complimentary about these photographs. And I think it stuck with me. I was in sixth grade at that time. And by the time I was in high school, I kept seeing the world. So as an artist, you started as a photographer. You were seeing the world through the lens. I... I Exactly. At 15, I remember I was framing everything, and my grandfather bought me my first camera. Aha. Uh -huh. So that, that was an inspiration right mm -hmm. there. Absolutely. And so do you, do you still see the world in frames? Um, I don't, actually, but I do fantasize about going back to, to working in still photography sometimes. Well, there's nothing to stop you, really, is there? No, no, no. there's not. All you got to have is a camera. Mm-hmm. Have and, a few of those. And I know you've got a few of those. <laughs> I've seen a few of those. So, so what what then led you to documentaries? I mean, I, you said we said it in the opening that you were led to it by going to Montana State University, but and, and that going out in your first assignment was out in the wild. But did you always have a fascination for documentary films? Um, as an undergraduate, um, I studied. Um, art history and photography mm -hmm. and the first documentary I remember seeing that had a real impact on me was made by a photographer um, named Mary Ellen Mark okay and it was it's a documentary about the street kids in Seattle called Streetwise and I had never seen anything like it it was this expose of of how the these little kids you know really young survive on the street and it stuck with me. Uh, little did I know, you know, a decade later, I'd be going into science and natural history mm -hmm. filmmaking. 
Um, but this was the urban wild, not the wild wild. Right. No, that was not not the wild wild. So um, I didn't. I when I left my undergraduate, I was not planning on pursuing. Um, documentary filmmaking at all. In fact, I was on the path to become a museum curator. Really? Really. You you wanted to be working in museums? Yep. Did you have a museum in mind that was like the the goal for you? Well, I grew up um, just outside of New York City. I grew up in northern New Jersey, and the uh, university I went to as an undergraduate, William Patterson, uh, was a college at the time. Now it's a university. It was um, just so close to New York City. We were in the city all the time at galleries and museums. And I didn't want to stay there. I didn't want to be in New York City. I want. I needed an adventure. Um, at 20 years old, I d- took a green tortoise trip across the country. What is a green tortoise trip? Oh, man. It's a company. I don't know if it still exists. It was based in San Francisco. And it's basically they take old school buses and convert them into green tortoises. Green tortoise, yeah. They paint them, they paint them um, green screen green, <laughs> so you can imagine a, a bus. <laughs> and they do trips across the country, going to the national parks and hiking and camping. And that was my first real taste of adventure. I went by myself at twenty, jumped on this bus in New York City. I can remember my parents saying goodbye to me and saying, well, call us if you need us to rescue you when this bus breaks down, you know. <laughs> and um, Especially because it was painted green. Yeah. So, you know, growing up in New York and New Jersey and, and being, you know, kind of in the middle of it all, I hadn't experienced um, wilderness, really. And that trip brought me to the South Dakota Badlands and changed my life forever. So once you were out in South Dakota, this was an op- an eye-opening experience for you. Yeah, I um I went on my first real hike, you know, outside of Girl Scouts, and uh, was completely in love. I completely fell at peace, um, and all I wanted to do was go back. You knew you'd found your element. Yep, that's 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 where I I wanted to be. In wild places, and and you said we said it in the opening that that you had found your bliss by uh, documenting bison in Yellowstone National Park, and that's the key is to find your bliss, is it not? Well, that's what Joe says. Um, yes, Joseph Campbell. <laughs> yeah, I, and I mean, as an undergraduate, I was a huge fan of Joseph Campbell and his work, and mm-hmm. I mean, clearly, I'm still using his key phrase, but it, it was important to me. I was seeking something. And finding it was the most satisfying thing ever. And I, f- I feel like I found it really young. Um, I had great opportunities at a really young age, and my curiosity just kept leading me. Um, you were older than 20 when you say young, right? Um, at, at 22, I left for Alaska. Uh-huh. So, so you knew it at 22. That is young. At, at um, at 20, I knew I was leaving New Jersey, and my goal was to move to South Dakota. Huh. <laughs> but twist of events, I ended up in Washington State, and with the the goal of getting um, residency, so I could go to the University of Washington for my master's in museum studies. Mm-hmm. And um, so, graduate from William Patterson. Waitress for the summer, save a bunch of money, and then I drive across the country to um, Washington State, and I kind of, you know, figuring things out. I had never been on my own. I end up waitressing, and one of my coworkers, her whole goal, she had just moved to Washington State as well, her entire goal was to get to Alaska and to work for um, a tourism company and get on these small yachts that were always leaving Seattle and going up to Juneau, Alaska, up the Inside Passage. Mm-hmm. So she did all of this legwork to get this job. And you'd never been on a yacht either. I'll I'd bet. never been on a yacht. I mean, I, that was, I mean, I was a New Jersey kid. So, um, and I wasn't looking to get on a yacht either, but she said, hey, I have this, this, I have to go pick up my uniform and sign some documents. Come and see this yacht I'm working on. I was like, okay. You know, and so I drove her to her new job and the hotel, hotel manager was on the ship and said, okay, so what are you doing this ship, small motorized vessel? Not 
not like a yacht, like motorized vessels that take 80 to 100 passengers. We did call them yachts, but they're they're not, you know, like what you would there, imagine. There's no stateroom in it. <laughs> there are rooms, but yeah, it's um, they were all little tiny natural history, like river boats, really. Mm-hmm. Um, well, 100 people in a boat's a bunch of people on a boat. Yeah, but it's not cl- like cl- Princess Cruise it's Line. It's not a cruise like 2000... line, but, but 100 people on a boat yeah. is still a lot of people on yeah, a boat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I go to see this boat and I'm standing on the top deck and the hotel manager is quizzing me and I guess they hadn't, they weren't staffed up yet and they were starting in a, in a couple of weeks. And she asked me if there was anything keeping me in Seattle for the summer and I couldn't come up with a good excuse. And two weeks later I was on a boat in Alaska cleaning rooms and making beds and serving meals. And- I started out. As a maid and a waitress. And was this happy happy time for you? Was it it fun? It was unbelievable. I could not believe my luck. And the door that had opened. And I walked right through it and never looked back. Mm -hmm. Um, I miss Alaska every day of my life. Well, it's still there if you wanted to go visit. (laughs) So in total, I spent eight seasons working in Alaska in different positions um, but all for um, natural history and expedition travel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, um, when you when you look out into the world and you've had that experience, that's how you started. And then it wasn't until you got to school before you realized you could become, or no, it was I, your experience at IMAX before you discovered you could actually turn this passion into some kind of an art form, i.e. making documentaries about it. So to condense the, st- condense the timeline a bit, um, I spent four years working for Alaska Sightseeing Cruise West, touring um, the Inside Passage and South Central Alaska. Over and over again? Um, over and over again. Um, so you got to know it very well. Oh, is, yeah. Is I got, question. got to know it. You know, I could, I could, you know, see an island and ID it. And I wasn't a boat captain by any means, but... Um, Spent a lot of time up there doing natural history interpretation and doing cu- lots of customer service. So, right? so okay, for the audience, what is natural history interpretation? So, um, for one full year, I worked and lived on a yacht that was an overnight yacht that took 80 to 100 passengers up the Inside Passage um, through Canada, up through Alaska, and turning around in Juneau and coming back. Uh, then uh, the the next year, I was uh, land based and worked on a day yacht, and they um, convinced me to get my CDL, and I was also a bus driver. What's a CDL? Commercial driver's license. Ah. So I at twenty five. Um, Learned how to drive a bus and um, drove the passengers from their hotel in Anchorage to a town called Whittier in Alaska. And at that time, the only way to get into Whittier was by train. So they didn't tell me this uh, before (laughs) I went up to Alaska to get to finalize my CDL training. But we had to drive the bus up onto a train bed that had six inches only on either side, <laughs> with passengers on the bus. Charming. Yeah, I did not sleep the night. I found out I had to do that in the morning. But once you do it, once you get used to driving the bus, it's it's not. It, it was really really fun, and I think that did more for my self confidence as a young person than anything. I was terrified of this giant machine, and through the right training and and gaining confidence to do it and learning about the engine and learning about the bus and and driving it up onto a train platform and going through a tunnel into Whittier, Alaska every day while speaking, talking the entire time and pointing out the different natural history things that the passengers should see. Because you were giving tours at the same time. I was talking the entire time. Um, So it was really, really fun. Um, And uh, it, it did a lot for me to to go okay I can do it if I try it if I'm if I put my mind to it I can do it because uh, that was a really terrifying for me to drive a giant bus 
a 47 passenger bus on a two lane highway, the Seward Highway in Alaska, and then drive it on a train. And then I would drop the passengers off in Whittier. And I'd lock up the bus and we'd all get onto a boat and spend the day in Prince William Sound. So I would grab a microphone on the boat and then point out all the glaciers and the wildlife. And um, we would end up the next, uh, later that day in Valdez, Alaska. We would overnight in Valdez, turn around and start the next morning with a different group of passengers, spend the whole day on the yacht, um, get to Whittier, unlock my bus and warm it up, grab the passengers, and then drive them to Anchorage. So I did this for two summers. And and did you get ideas for, did it inspire you to think of stuff that you could do on film? I wasn't thinking about film at all, at I, but all. I had my camera with me the entire time. You my took still a lot camera, of pictures, right? A lot, all on slide film. <laughs> slides it's all slides wow. it's all slides right that is an older technology that is no so this is um 1992 to 1995 mm-hmm. right all right so then at that point um someone convinced me to uh apply with the next company i worked for an international company that owned a ship called the world discoverer uh uh, and actually, a, a was a gentleman I was involved with that I met in Alaska, and he wanted to go to Antarctica. It was his dream. And I was like, Antarctica? That, you're crazy. And um, so he set up interviews for us, and I got the job, and he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. So the reason I was hired is the ship is German-owned, and I had studied German, um, and I worked... Um, Alaska Sightseeing Cruise West was a company that the hiring manager at Society Expeditions knew really well, and he knew my past boss. So it was like, right, networking, small world stuff, connection. Um, And they also wanted to use some of my photographs. So the fact that I spoke German, had worked as a cruise director already, and um, could hopefully contribute some marketing materials got me the job. Mm -hmm. So... I started out there on the opposite side of the world. I started out, my very first trip working with them was um, flying to Rarotonga in the Cook Islands and um, meeting my first group of passengers on a place I'd never been before, and I was supposed to be guiding them. (laughs) You're supposed to be an expert. (laughs) Yes. And you'd never been there before. (laughs) I was so lucky that the Cook Islands... um, is an English-speaking country <laughs> because <laughs> otherwise I would have been really in trouble. Um, and, I, you know, I just went with the confidence that I was leading them, um, young and adventurous, and it was unbelievable, unbelievable adventure. So I leave what I know, Alaska, and I start in the South Pacific with my new job. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, how long after that did you wind up in school? in order to start thinking about what you ultimately are doing? So, um, roughly four years later. You decided to go, and this was after working for IMAX, right? Yeah, so, okay, to to wrap that up, I started with Society Expeditions. I spent two years on their ship. I started as an assistant expedition leader. Um, Society Expeditions, international ship, multiple languages, um, they have a hotel staff, and so it's, it's like 60, 40, 60 English-speaking passengers, 40 German-speaking passengers. Right. Um, so everything was done in two languages. So Germ- the German I had really helped so I could translate daily programs and things um, from German to English. I was never translating anything into German. Uh, and the... Um, The hotel manager and the captain started pushing me, we want you to be our next expedition leader. And I was terrified. You know, I was like, no, I'm happy as the assistant. I just got here. And they're they're like, no, we think that you should fill this role. And, you know, stroke of luck, whatever, the shortly after I started, the current expedition leader threw her her back out. And I had two days notice and I was in charge. So I was the expedition leader on that ship for... Was this your first producing job? Producing. Yes, uh, were, as, were you? Were you? So you had to be organized. You had to uh, manage various things and people. 
this is what producers do. It's live production. That's exactly what I tell my students. I, I, you know, from from tourism to catering to wedding planning to um, film production, it's all the same skills apply. So yeah, actually, it was my first producing job. I was pro- I was doing live production. We had multiple experts on the ship bringing different groups by zodiac to different places we were visiting uninhabited islands so i was cramming at night and it was the first the first time we ever did the Aleutians. so i didn't even have a chance to read a book about the Aleutian chain you know i found out you know i, I was not an expert but um at that point we had a an alaska marine pilot based out of Dutch Harbor that came with us to go through the Aleutians and he knew every nook and cranny of the islands and was really supportive in bringing the passengers to these beautiful places and educating the the staff you know on where we were going and what we could find there I mean we would land all totally remote uninhabited Um, we visited a few existing villages and ADAC uh, which was a naval base in the Aleutians. But that was my, you know, f- my introduction. So again, I'm in a position where I'm leading and I've never been there before. So this is all this is all um, build up work to something you don't even know you're going to do yet. Right. It, it's preparatory work and you don't know you're in preparatory work. I, I'm saying that so that the audience has an understanding that everything you do in your life as an artist should in some way ultimately give you some kind of support for what it is you wind up doing and that that's how you should look at your experiences not as a waste of time ever because everything that you do has a potential to get you to something else so how how, let's get to imax how did you get to imax okay so i have to go back just a little bit so the world discoverer goes up uh, way, way north, um, and we visited an island that has um, a small village of Inupiat natives on it called Little Diomede, right? Big Diomede is right next to it, and Big Diomede is Russia. So little... Everyone knows girls want a Big Diomede. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, Little Diomede and the village on Little Diomede left such an impression on me um, I fell in love with the people, and the following year, we almost couldn't make it to the island because it was iced in. And I was on the phone from the home office in Seattle talking to one of the village elders, um, Philip Akinga, I believe was his name, and he said something to me on the phone that was a moment, like the moment where I went, oh my God, I have to do something. He said, Okay, the ice has broken, and I'm so glad your ship and your passengers will be able to come to visit our village and our culture before it's gone. Mm. So they, I hung up the phone and was sobbing, right? Because they are living with this awareness that their culture is disappearing, Mm -hmm. right? That they can't sustain their culture. Their young people are leaving to go to college in the lower 48, right down here. Um, Because there is no college up there. No, no, the island has... You know, around 100 people on it, really. Sure. And they're, you know, they, they're subsistence hunters on the ice and um, eat seabirds. And, like, it, it was just such an amazing, amazing culture. I, I felt so lucky to get to experience. So um, get to a point in my life where I can't, like, almost 10 years on ships. My family's on the East Coast, um, and my sister's having babies so I decide I'm going to move back east um, and you know live on land for a while because it was amazing to be on this boat it was pre pre email pre cell phones right so the only way I had to communicate with family was by sending letters or fax or calling from shore so it was like this amazing purgatory right it was it was not your life it was this temporary situation it was absolutely this amazing adventure but everything you knew and everything you knew about your life was not with you it was not part of your mm-hmm. life it was like creating something new so I you know after that amount of time I was like okay I, I want to go back and be with my family and and experience these new people that have joined my family my my nephew um and ended up and I didn't know what I would would, would do and I ended up interviewing in New York City for jobs with different art companies um, doing sales for you know 
art prints and things like that. And <laughs> after having lived on this ship for so long in the wilderness and, and having this really specific working 24 seven, you know, you work for two months at a time and then you have a month off on the ship. You don't work an eight hour day. You work a 16 hour day. Um, and so I end up like kind of this lost soul going, what am I doing? Walking around wandering New York city, going for job interviews. I don't want to be here. And I had the good fortune of um, interviewing with a brand new theater that they built um, in West Nyack, New York, a brand new IMAX theater. IMAX is a technology, right? But they were opening their own but, theaters. But they, but they, te- IMAXs need to be in a special space. Right, right. So they built this special space um, in West. Uh, actually, was in a shopping mall, which was was really horrible. You know, I had left New Jersey and had always been like, oh, the shopping mall world, and then ended up working at an IMAX theater in a shopping mall after having 10 years of these adventures. I'm like, this doesn't fit, but the job was great. Um, I became the um, educational sales representative for that IMAX theater, and I would run special events, like we'd host astronauts to come in and open, do premieres of, of IMAX films. We'd have biologists come. And these are the kinds of things I would set up on the ships. Biologists would travel with us, marine biologists, and they would lecture about the animals. And then we'd go swim and look for the animals, you know, snorkel or dive and look for the animals. Well, so it was a fit. I could walk the walk. I went and we met the specialists and I was hosting them. I had been to some of the places they had studied at. You know, so it was a really great fit. But it was a, a moment standing in the IMAX theater watching Africa the Serengeti with a, a theater full of children, hearing James Earl Jones, you know, talking about the wildebeest going across the plains. And I went, holy crap. What am I doing in, in, in a shopping mall movie theater? I can make these movies. I can do this. So that's what you call an epiphany. It was the epiphany. And, and before that, I was planning on leaving that area and, and going back out west. And, I, and Bozeman, Montana was my goal. And I was thinking, oh, I, can, I can go back for an MBA. There's a decent business school in Bozeman um, at Montana State. And... So I got, I was like, okay, I went back and opened up the website for the school and what comes up but an advertisement for their brand new program in science and natural history filmmaking. Mm. It was just this, this overlapping of events. And the kicker was they I, were. I, I, I would subscribe that it's um, serendipity. Uh, yep. I have a. It's supposed to be that way. You know, you, it, but, you know, everyone has opportunities. It's taking advantage of them, right? So, or, or well, making well, them. Well, that's it. It's taking advantage of those things that are presented to you. And you, you make choices. I'm going this way or that way. And whatever those choices are, um, you live with them, whether you like it or not. And you can then make more choices. But sometimes if you make the right choice and it's in your heart, then you do the right thing and you get lucky. Or you think you're lucky, but it's actually serendipity. It's a great word. I love serendipity. Um, so you wound up in Bozeman. Well, I had to convince them. Okay, so obviously you did. You you wound up there. The program is specifically created to make scientists filmmakers, and I was not a scientist, but my natural history background was enough for for them to be convinced. I, you know, and I showed up with my portfolio of photographs, um, and. Um, I wrote about wanting to go back to Little Diomede and film. Mm-hmm. And did you get there? No. Never I got did there. not. Maybe you will. Maybe you will. Uh, you're you're, it, you're still think... young enough. <laughs> uh, 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 so, so, the, so, okay, you, now you're in Bozeman. You go out in the wilderness on your first week, and you start shooting bison with a, with a, a video camera, not a still camera, right? Right. Did they provide that for you? Did you have to get your own equipment? The the school, the program was supported by Discovery Channel. Uh, Discovery Ah. Channel gave a $6 million grant to Montana State to buy equipment and set up this program. So they were looking for people that they could develop. That's a a very interesting thing. That's another thing to suggest to uh, those of uh, the listeners out there that are curious. You can look for programs that are supported by companies that do what you want to do, and frequently that's a great opportunity. 
you know. Sorry. So now you've gone out and you've you've shot bison and you're going, I like shooting bison in the wild. Bison don't move really fast, so they're pretty easy so they're to They're easy film. to sneak up on, huh? Um Yeah, they're very easy to sneak up on, but you don't want to startle one. I I, I we have a few students around here I can do the same thing to. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, so I I found the perfect fit. You know, they accepted 20 students into that program. Um, I was an older student, but for grad school, I was the, the perfect age. I was 30, 31. Mm-hmm. And um, it the is, very first... It is good to go to graduate school after a few years of life. Yeah, I, I because you know what you want to do instead sure. of going through the motion motions. But um, And you appreciate the schooling much more so. Also, the the first month of school, we all ended up at the Jackson Hole Wildlife Film Festival and got to meet a bunch, meet the the top of the top of the uh, of of natural history filmmakers presenting there, showing their films. It's a really small group of people. Um, if you went to a wildlife film festival anywhere in the world, you'd see the same group of people at mm-hmm. these film festivals. I would think that's a fairly small number of people that, oh, worldwide that do what you're talking about. Yeah, it's very, very specialized. So, um, but unfortunately, the first uh, week of week of school, um, September 11th happened, and it, it was mm. really shocking. Uh, like, there's, I could say a lot about that, but really what happened is um, funding was pulled out from the arts, right? One of the goals of the program was every student had to raise their own money to make their film. Interesting, okay. And it became very difficult to secure grants for for films and for art at that time. Uh, so uh, it was a, a bigger challenge uh, to to do that. But we, uh, so I took, I took uh, some time to figure out how to do that and through a, a colleague in film school uh, was introduced to a veterinarian named Dr. Jonathan Arzt. Um It was like, so amazing to be with like-minded people and people that were traveling to places that were familiar to me. Uh, Paul Hillman um, came to the program um, as a um, and, and worked on a film about fur seals in the Pribilof Islands and he did it for Noah. While he was in the Pribilofs working with fur seals he met Dr. Jonathan Arzt who was there studying um, mortality uh, infant mortality in fur seals and this veterinarian pitched a film idea to my my grad school colleague Paul Hillman and um, Dr. Arzt was studying a disease in horses on Easter Island. Mm-hmm. And he was looking for somebody to come and make a documentary about his work. Well, I'd been to Easter Island, and he, he was specifically looking for somebody who knew the island. Because when you get there as a brand new tourist that has never been to Polynesia or, or anywhere, the last thing you want to do is work. The place is so unbelievable that you're going to be distracted from any goal you have. So the fact that I'd been there, it was out of my system. I knew how to behave in a Polynesian culture. I, I knew that time works very differently there and um, ended you, up going. You, you had inadvertently done a lot of research. Yeah, I know. I know. See, my mother thinks that everything was set up in advance, like my whole the whole timeline was of was, your life of my life was like a master plan and i just look back and it was just a series of happy accidents i think that most successful people have that feeling that that you may set out to do one thing but you wind up doing another or you modify it in some way and that that's in fact the way that life works is that you it's one link of, of each chain goes in a di- in whatever direction it goes in so yeah and you, c- clearly you were as i said before you were preparing by all that tr- travel to be able to do what you ultimately did so you're now you're in the easter island and you've got cameras um did tons of pre-production to get there had a a full story that i was you know goal to get okay that's good i was that was a question i had for you how much how much do you know what you want to do before you go out to make a documentary do you you plan it out it's tons and tons of research so 
You're working, this was a science film, right? It was based on a hypothesis made by this veterinarian and using the scientific method as my narrative structure. The scientific method became your narrative structure. So that inquiry as to where you begin and how you lay it out and how you proceed and how you come to a conclusion, which seems very much like narrative storytelling in a way. It's a kind of a weird parallel. That before this moment, I never thought of it that way, but that's good. That's really good. It is, uh, it is like structural storytelling. It's my favorite kind of storytelling because... Um, any documentary you make, you go in with a master plan, and there's it, really the the final story is always a complete surprise, mm-hmm. right? Something always happens that you don't expect, and that becomes the story arc. Well, you're well, you're okay. So this is what's interesting to me about the difference between narrative storytelling and documentaries, which theoretically often become narrative stories. But you don't start out contriving a narrative story. You you say, I'm going to go shoot X, Y, or Z, correct? And then a story comes around at some point. Well, I was really fortunate because he had really put a lot of time, and Jonathan Arch, this, this veterinarian, put a lot of time and thought into how to make it a story and how, I mean, it's Easter Island. Everyone goes, oh, the island has no people and those giant heads. Not true at all. And so... They, they don't have giant heads they, there? Oh, there's definitely giant... Well, they're not really. They're torsos. They're not just heads. You just see the heads because the rest of the body is under, underneath. underground. Um, he went there to solve the mystery... By the time I met him, he had solved the mystery, but I had a setup for the film. Um, and it, so it became like, okay, he went to find something and he found it, and now he's doing the research. But So that's not a really very exciting story, except that it's on Easter Island and it's with horses and it's beautiful. Most most research is not very interesting filmmaking either. It's not compelling to watch. So you have to go out and you have to make it visually compelling as well as from a storytelling sense. And you have to decipher the complex ideas, the, the, um, the science, so that, you know, every single person that watches your documentary can understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you have to simplify things down to a... A uh, little more common denominator. Exactly, exactly. And um, thank you for phrasing it that way. You know, well, that's that's what a, a lot of storytelling is that way. You're, you you don't. I don't think you want to go to the lowest common denominator, but you have to come down to some commonality, or you lose most of the potential audience. In grad school, we were told it was a sixth grade level. Sixth grade. Sixth grade. So there's an intentional. Um, goal to get it to a sixth grade level of education right so that people will understand it and does that is that a negative for people who are very advanced in their thinking does it become Um, boring to them the whole the whole goal of the um mfa in science and natural history was to make scientists filmmakers because scientists don't trust journalists or filmmakers because they're always searching for the most sensational idea to exploit right Right. And which is very necessary in this field because you have to attract attention um, or create a compelling story. Right. And that's often sensational in order to raise money or or get even interest. Right. If I just started talking to you about liver failure and horses who, you know, I would lose my audience immediately. But if that's my favorite subject, (laughs) liver, liver disease and horses, all the horses on Easter Island drink too much. I've got I've (laughs) I've got all the books. (laughs) So but the the, the thing that was in my favor is there's there's this finite amount of information on Easter Island. You can read it all in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, The stuff that's that is not factual because there's a lot of false history about Easter Island that's out there and then stuff that's factual and then all of his scientific papers I could read and show up and understand follow him and and at, and create ways for him to explain what he was doing so that everyone could understand what he was talking about okay so you've done your you've been to Easter Island before you know you know your way around you understand the culture you uh, you you uh, have done your due diligence in terms of research about the story you're about to go shoot now you take a bunch of equipment with you on, I assume, planes and boats and however else you get there. It's so easy to get there. It's, it's easier easy. to get there than it is to get to Montana. Okay. 
Well, so it's a flight. It's a flight to Santiago, and then a flight from uh, to, in Chile to, and then a flight from Santiago to Easter Island. Okay, it's All right. pretty simple. So now you've you've taken your equipment with you because you're not going to find a rental house on Easter Island, I assume. No. And so you've taken everything you need with you. You've had to plan for, I assume, some contingencies in case things go downhill one way or another. Um, what I'm getting at is from a producer's perspective to go out. This is a big question for me, for you, about documentary filmmaking. When we when we make a narrative structure movie, a Hollywood-style movie, whether we're in some other city than Los Angeles or wherever, um, there is a tendency to be able to have a lot of stuff already pre-planned. The story's pre-planned. You've already hired your actors and all the people on the crew. In a documentary, you're working with far fewer people in the first place. There's not a giant crew. You don't have you don't have uh, honey wagons with you on the on your excursion, and you're out somewhat on your own in the wild. And my big question, which is where this is coming from, is what do you? I mean, what do you do to prepare? as a documentary filmmaking, to go shoot out in a natural environment that is very different? Or what do you have to think about that's different from shooting in a city or or with a great big crew? So um, I was really lucky that I had raised enough money to be able to bring one person with me. Mm -hmm. So you had a two-person crew. Two-person crew, um, a really, really dear friend, and also another person um, in this uh, that took part of this MFA program, and he was part MacGyver. So he really, <laughs> I sw- he saved me. He's a uh, professional sound person now, and you know, clearly he was, he was on, on a, a human Swiss Army he knife. Seriously, was. Um, but on our way there, you know, I had multiple conversations on the phone with Dr. Arts, but had never met him in person. We actually met him in the Santiago airport and we didn't have anything set up on Easter Island. It was basically meet me and trust me. We didn't have a hotel. We had nothing. Wow. That's gutsy. It was jumping and right. It's another Joseph Campbell quote. Leap. Before you look, right? Leap, you'll you'll land, you know. So we, I, I, I took this leap of faith and trusted him, and uh, know know how it works in in a place like Easter Island. So I, I, I was, I had faith that it would work out. But I, you know, I showed up. I had uh, my camera, tons of of gear, lots of sound gear, um, some lights. That was pretty much it. I had the basic, basic amount of gear. At a, was this videotape? It was, was video. It was SD. At video SD. SD. But I was shooting at 24p, which was very exciting. That's <laughs> <laughs> a Panasonic camera. Um, and just by luck, and uh, the governor of the island was on the flight from Santiago to Easter Island with us. And by the time we made it to Easter Island, John had set up full accommodations for all of us and vehicles. So that, that that's the other interesting thing is you're, you, I would think that being a documentary filmmaker really requires you to have a lot of fortitude, a lot of guts. You, you're taking risks all the time. Do you, do you plan for safety and all that sort of thing too? Um, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I look back now at a couple of situations I was in, and I feel really lucky that everything worked out. That you survived. That, that I survived. Um, exactly. But, uh, yeah, it's just trusting that it's going to work out. Another thing that I um, went into this knowing but not knowing how I was going to react was um, John Art's work involved a lot of euthanasia. So when he, you know, the story is about um, horses on Easter Island, an introduced species that got started getting this strange disease um, in the 90s that the locals thought was mad cow disease. Mm-hmm. So the film's called Caballo Loco on Easter Island, Crazy Horse. And, you know, a, a few simple things, and it was awesome to set up the mystery and the conclusion, but basically... Around the time a plant was introduced to the island to control soil erosion on the island, the horses started to get sick, right? John figured this out pretty quickly. Um, So by the time, 
and the basic the illness really is liver failure because they're eating this toxic plant so when he's examining horses that are suffering from this illness they're in the late stages of liver failure and they're dying so the humane thing to do is euthanize them and i filmed multiple euthanasias and necropsies um, animal autopsies where he was cutting open horses and taking organ samples mm. um and I signed documents, you know, because it, sometimes it was not a very simple thing. If these animals were extremely dehydrated and um, using, you know, the, the euthanasia fluid, the injections often didn't work because they they're, they were in such a state of dehydration that it wouldn't even flow through their system. So I did, you know. Make, so they suffered further? Um, it didn't kill them? Yeah, they, they used more local ways to euthanize the animals sometimes um and so i was there to witness it right it, and it was humane it was definitely humane but it was it was hard and having the camera in front of me really created the separation where i was not emotional about it i was documenting science i did was you, documenting important did you feel science. like you were watching the movie as you were yes, looking it through was the really lens? it was totally surreal mm -hmm. um and uh, like it was really interesting to learn. It, one day they, they did have to put down a dog, and I couldn't stay hmm. um, because it, I, with, it was with emotional. The, with the same problem? No, no. The, well, the dog had eaten some uh, a poison. They didn't know what, and so it was dying. Was, so they was very sick. The dog was really sick, and they had to put it down, and the owner was, was devastated. Mm -hmm. um, but it wanted to do the humane thing for the dog, and they couldn't see their dog suffer any longer. And I was like, um... I'll be back in a few minutes, and I, <laughs> I couldn't go back. I never went oh, back. Boy. So it was interesting to see how I could separate the work from some, you know, I, I, I never, didn't have a relationship with horses before that. It, it might have been very different for you if you didn't have a camera. Right, if I was just, I couldn't, I wouldn't have sat there and watched it, no. You would have walked away, but yeah. this, was, this was part of your job and your function, and you needed to look through the camera, and you needed to make sure shots were framed appropriately, and you could see what you wanted to see, and things were in focus, and all those good things. So, so that camera actually becomes, uh, I guess, a, a kind of, I don't want to use the word barrier, it becomes a, a, some kind of a window through which you're looking, and you can become dispossessed of the reality in front of you somewhat, because you're not facing it face-to-face, -face, you're facing it through the lens. That's a very interesting way to think about how, how you're doing this. Um, do you have a, is there a rule of thumb as to how much footage you need to shoot to wind up with um, a certain amount of footage at the end that becomes a, a movie or TV show or a short or whatever? Yeah, but when I made this film, I was a student. So you didn't know what you were doing in that way as well? No, I shot is, 64 hours 64 of hours and, for a 25-minute film. Okay, 64 hours for... <laughs> <laughs> it was hell. That, the edit was hell. The, ed, the edit is now a, a in my mind a nightmare. <laughs> the, it was fortunately a lot of the footage are horses in corrals being you know herded together. And so so you, had to, you had to find all those uh, nuggets. Yep. There. So the routine was we would have John would have an appointment to go to one of the ranches to inspect the horses. Um, he'd bring vitamins and medicines and um, deworming stuff that was really important. And he was going around the island with the goal of teaching people how to take care of their animals. Um, that culling your herd, you know, it, having horses on Easter Island has is a, there's a great sense of pride to own horses on the island. It, it's they're it, seeing a, a horse, and they are allowed to roam freely on the island because there's only so much water that they can access so I, I mean I clearly could talk about this forever it was the, one of the best adventures of my lifetime but um I've lost track of what the question was well the, the question was is how much footage do you okay roll? so way too much and but it came like I had to tell the process of what John was looking for so he every single time he examined a horse he would explain everything he was doing he would um, walk the audience, right? We were always making this for an audience through the signs of, of the liver failure. And then um, the horse would get put down. And then I'd start rolling the camera again as he is taking out the organs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I learned a great deal about anatomy 
from I'm sure you from did. This. It was a, it, it was fascinating. Um, and then I would show the different how the interior I would do close ups, right? If you showed an entire horse on the ground, it was you know, so learning what can an audience take was also really important. And PBS even put, you know, a warning on my film that it was graphic. I'm like, what do you mean it's graphic? You see a horse and then you see close-ups of its organs. It's yeah, not, but it's graphic. seeing someone's liver, someone, a horse's liver clearly was not, I had gotten de- really desensitized to some of the things that I'd so, so Okay, so, so you were learning as a student at that point um, in general, Today, if you were going to go out and shoot the same thing again, if you were going to go make that movie today with your knowledge and experience from years of, of doing it, w- would you come about it in a different uh, way? Um, <laughs> clearly, I would shoot far less, and I would want to hang out on the ranches way more. Um, it was so awesome to be invited in. Like Here I am, this outsider, coming to this really unique culture. And because I was with a veterinarian who was helping them, they just opened their doors and you became part of their family mm-hmm. for that day. Mm-hmm. And that was amazing. What I would do differently, the f- I, I went back to the island three times to finish this work. I spent a month there the first time and got most of John's story. But the story arc, the surprise was that in his research, he discovered that cows were also dying from this plant. But it was the disease, the the toxin was manifesting itself in a different way in the cows than it was in the horses. Mm. Horses have a single stomach like we do, so the toxins were killing them rapidly. Cows have the four-chambered stomach, and the they were having weird, really weird birth defects in the cows, And the locals on the island eat the cows. They eat the organ meat. They eat Mm. the liver. So he discovered that it was a human health issue. And that was was the story. Like, is it now a human health issue? Are people going to die from eating the horses on Easter, excuse me, the cows on Easter Island? Um, Why didn't this problem, I'm, I'm, I'm a little off topic here, but I'm curious. Why didn't this problem crop up a lot earlier in the world? The, 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 it was a natural plant, I assume. It was an introduced plant. Oh, it was an introduced plant. An introduced plant called um, Cro- Crotillaria grahamiana on the island is called Chocho. So it was introduced to help with soil erosion on the island, and it was really successful at helping control the soil erosion. But they didn't know it was poisonous to the horses. They did not. Well, because the island goes through some dry periods and there's way too many horses on the island and then the island can sustain the horses are eating everything that they find Mm -hmm. and normally in a normal situation on a ranch here ranchers would control this toxic plant they would keep their horses away from the plant and and the horses wouldn't eat it they'd feed them hay right there it the horses are eating it out of desperation Mm -hmm. interesting okay so now you've got in this case, 64 hours to make 25 minutes. But let's assume it's not quite that much. Ooh, sorry, I realized what I was... So when I went... The first time I was there, I made the decision not to go into the slaughterhouse, right? When he started to look at the cows and, and gather some of the organs from cows to bring back to study um, in the U.S., I was like, okay, I've got enough footage. I've seen enough... I. And I personally have no interest in spending any time in the slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit this one out. Mm -hmm. Huge mistake. Big, big mistake. And I'm so lucky I got to go back the following year and film in the slaughterhouse Mm -hmm. because that is where it's defined that these horse, these, these cows could be, um, poisoned, poisoning the people that live on the island and so are eating They were the being local poisoned, cows. which then poisoned. It's the food chain. It poisons down, right? down the line. So the it it's at the time it was still difficult to de- to determine because liver failure is liver failure, right? So you can't if you took a biopsy of my liver, you couldn't determine why I had liver failure. You could just say I have it, right? So it's very difficult to determine if that person got liver failure from some other environmental toxin or from eating. You almost have to have a group that you remove it from and see what happens. Right. I mean that's that's the way you do it. Okay, so now you have all this footage and whether it's something that's, you know, brand new that you're doing today or something from 20 years ago, um you have all this footage. How much of your movie, your story, is created in post-production? Um, all of it. All of it. Right? So, you show up with chaos. 
knowing you got the sequences you need, knowing... Do you, you know, have a sense from all the footage that you shot? Do you have a sense, I've got a story in here somewhere, I just have to find it? Yes, because some, some it's just when the circumstances are right. I shot 20 different, 20 to 22 different um, horse examinations, necropsies. Wow. And... Um, Piece, different pieces of them are used, but you knew when the sequence was working, right? You knew, and, and having the opportunity to repeat the same thing over and over, him examining the horse, right? Um, he's, very, he's very scientific and methodical about it. And on my return to the island, I realized I needed to get more compassion from him for the animals because he loves the animals, but we got like him acting as a scientist and a researcher, um, so he's more cold and clinical than he's warm and loving. Right. And that's what you were trying to get to. Um, well, no, it was really, really hard to get out of him, the human story. Mm -hmm. Here is the scientist researching these horses, and that was his eighth trip back to the island. Wow. He does all the legwork. He raises all the money. He, he gets um, expired drugs and vitamins and things from veterinary uh, supply companies across the country. He works hard. He was a graduate student at the time as well. He was just finishing his Ph.D. And it was, why are you doing this? Why? As, so it's really interesting what you've discovered, but the audience is going to want to know why this person has dedicated so much of his life to this but cause. you didn't know that before you shot the footage. No, I didn't. You discovered it after you shot the footage. I discovered it after spending two months with him on the island. And that then becomes the driving part of the narrative of the documentary itself. Um, it became the conclusion of the documentary. The conclusion. So do, do, you, do you think of it at, in terms of... You've got a beginning, middle, and end. Do you have all those oh, absolutely. sort of narrative things? So you set up the mystery, right? I go backwards. I set up the mystery. Here, this young veterinarian is working in Chile with cattle. He's got some time off, and he decides to take a week and go to Easter Island on vacation. Loves to go fishing. Goes fishing on the island. The, you know, the minute you land there, people are inviting you over for dinner. It's a, it's a really, really... It was. It's, it might be different now. Um, really amazing place to go and have a, a fantastic non-Western experience, right, with, with a Polynesian culture, ancient culture. Um, so he goes there. Someone says, hey, you're a veterinarian. Can you come and look at my horse? And his whole story, his whole adventure begins, Right. Hotu Araki Tepano, one of the ranchers on the island, becomes a dear friend of John's. And John starts this whole adventure by examining one of his horses and trying to figure out what is killing, you know, randomly. Like, why does one horse get sick over the other? What, what is killing them? He brings back plant samples, water samples, organ samples, everything he can, and really quickly discovers it's this toxic plant, right? Here's, here's the thing that's killing them. So we could set up the story really, really easily. So what's interesting is, okay, so he solved the mystery of this, this crazy horse. What is he doing about it? What did he do? when? So now he has this great responsibility to go back to the island and share what he learned with the people and do something about it. And that's what the story became, right? There's all, the, the research quickly proved what he was trying to find. And then, and then how do you solve how, it? How does he solve it? He he hasn't solved it. He he can go back and educate people, but he had no support from the Chilean government. In fact, they they made it very difficult for him to do his work. Huh. Easter Island is part of the Chilean government. Yeah, I it's, it's I didn't know that. governed by Chile. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay, so we're gonna move away for a moment from uh, this fabulous story <laughs> about uh, Easter Island. You you've obviously when you worked for Nat Geo and and um, for. In, you were mostly in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. correct? Right. So when you worked for them, clearly you had a boss or two along the way, and you received notes on work that you did. I'm curious what, you know, how would you handle notes from somebody who was not understanding your story? How do you handle notes on a documentary? Notes on a documentary? 
I assume somebody um, was giving you some kind of notes. Oh, no. We had a, a great executive producer on Wild Chronicles, and she I, I learned so much from her, uh, Martha Conboy. Um, spectacular personality and started as an editor and, and worked her way to become an executive producer. If she didn't like your she, – she her critiques were amazing of your work, and if she didn't like your work, she used this phrase – Mm, I don't know. It's kind of a one-note samba, <laughs> right? And then you knew that the story wasn't interesting, right? How do you make it interesting? How do you, you know, some of them are just like, oh, I found this thing. Here's the information. Move on. How do you keep science and natural history interesting? It's the people doing the research that are interesting. Is is any part of it conflict? Um, it's solving problems. Solving problems. Right? Solving so the, mysteries. So, the, so con- the conflict is the unknown. I have a question. I don't know about mm-hmm. it. And I'm going to do the research. And I'm going to make just some discoveries. And that's going to be satisfying. Right? Mm-hmm. That's the, the story arc. And then, it, you know, it's the aha moment. Right? Oh, Eureka. I've got it. That's what you're bringing your audience along with. Um, what... Well, the thing with National Geographic, if your story was lacking, if you went out in the field and shot something, and often for uh, Wild Chronicles, our job was to make stories about the National Geographic explorers, the people that are receiving grants to do their research. They sign a contract that basically says anytime National Geographic wants, they can send a filmmaker to follow you around for as long as they need to. That's intrusive. Yeah, it's, I mean, but, you know, that's so be, careful, be that's careful what, what you sign. That's what documentarians do, by the way. Frequently they follow people around, and after a while the camera becomes a part of the, the wallpaper, and they p- don't pay attention, and then they let their guard down, and that's when you get some of the juicy stuff that you see in some documentaries. Right, that 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 they don't like. That they or, don't, they didn't want out there, but right? there it is. Um, so, 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 so the, the archives... At National Geographic, if your story doesn't have enough, you can build it with uh, with using the archives and all the footage that lived at Nat Geo. You could just keep improving upon your story with existing stock footage. Because they have a they have a huge library. Huge, unbelievable. And you can also tap into the National Archives as well, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we could buy outside stock footage, and there's there's all kinds of um, science stock footage houses it's it's incredible how much information is out there yeah, available i would think if you have the money if well it's, well <laughs> all of filmmaking is about the money right it's very it's gotten a little less expensive with prosumer cameras and so on but it's still about the money it's not free nope you know you still need it so can you think of a huge disaster you've been involved in while making a movie that you found your way out of and how you did it Didn't mean to stump you. Oh, no, no. It's not <laughs> stumping. Um, I, because the, all of the Easter Island stories, you made me think of, of a specific one there. Um, and then there is one in the Northern Territories of Australia that is really interesting as well. So, um, But since we're on the Easter Island, and mm-hmm. I mentioned my MacGyver buddy that came yeah. with us. So we got a call at uh, 2 a.m. that a horse was down in the middle of the road. Um, 10 minutes outside of the village that we were staying in in Easter Island and um, we were at a bar (laughs) so we packed everything up and went out to find this horse and um, it was dying on the side of the road and it had a a fairly newborn colt with it and it was hard to determine uh, what was wrong with it you know, that was it a die from the toxic plants? Was it hit by a car? Was it, you know, dying for, for other natural reasons? We didn't know. But here we were, 2 a.m. in the pitch dark in the middle of nowhere. Really, we're on the most remote inhabited island on the planet. And we couldn't see anything. All we had with us were what was, you know, the, the car lights. Well, my MacGyver, Eric Berg, <laughs> opens up a case and plugs in a, a head, a giant lamp to the car battery, and there we are, able to film and have a necropsy on the side of the road. So, so doing art and being creative requires great creativity. Great creative, great. <laughs> it's all creative problem solving. It is all problem right? solving, isn't it? And I would think documentaries are really about problem solving because you're frequently not sure what you're going to go do. Yes? Yes. I mean, you set you set a plan in motion, but then you're trying to capture things as they unfold without knowing how they're going to unfold. 
Right. When you when you it's learning what all the real motivating factors are and including the human stories in in the science that makes it really interesting. Interesting. Okay. So um, we're 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 gonna move along to a whole different aspect of your life, which is you've been teaching now for a number of years and um, I'm wondering, in terms of your student filmmakers, what are the most common mistakes that you see repeated that you would love them to come to school already having thought through or something that they shouldn't be repeating over and over again? What are the most common mistakes? Establishing shots. Establishing Students shots. Students never get establishing shots. And you, so you always start out, where are we? Right? All of a sudden you're like this close-up up somebody's nose and you're just like where is this person well you're the, the where you are is up somebody's nose yeah, exactly <laughs> so it's and that, that's consistent um we, but with the documentary students it's um I'm, let me see the doc i love watching the documentary students because i'm getting students that are already trained in narrative filmmaking mm-hmm. and they've worked with scripts and they've constructed things when they get their hands on the documentary process, they procrastinate and procrastinate because they don't understand how post-driven the documentary process is. And when I'm like, no, I want you starting on post like a month into the semester. You need to start, you know, have some interviews and start figuring out what visuals you need and where the story is going. And they postpone and sometimes they end up scrambling the last few weeks of the semester and, you know, hop, cobble together a mediocre film, Mm -hmm. right? Because they understand that they've got a script, they've got a plan, they plan to shoot it, and documentaries chaos compared to that. I'm actually envious of some of the narrative students and how much control. I'm like, you can control where the light goes, you know, like with, with, with a narrative film well, you, and in documentary. You And you know from a script that a character is going to walk in the door now. And you can repeat it over and over, over and over, over again. Right. And Doc, if, you know, the alien lands and you don't get a good shot of it, it didn't happen. Did Did you actually shoot an alien one time? No, not yet. Okay. I plan to. Okay. And in terms of school, what would you say to wannabe movie makers, what do you think the advantages are of going to school? Getting the practice. This is... This is the thing about documentary is the approach is repetitive, right? And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. It becomes you want it to become second nature. It's muscle muscle memory. It's muscle memory. And it seems so overwhelming when you make your first documentary. I mean, from assembling the gear to figuring to compiling the right questions to ask to doing all the research and then learning how to deal with real humans and not actors. Mm-hmm. Right, how to pull the gems out of people that you need and not have them seem artificial or like they're acting, like have it feel genuine and real. Because once you stick a camera in somebody's face, sometimes those people they freeze up, they act different, they don't know how to they don't know how to be natural. Right. Or or you know, their sound bites are ten minutes long or something, you know, because they have a lot to say. How mm-hmm. you know, so it's it's directing real people that's difficult. Um but it's, it's sorting through all the material to find the story also. What is the real story? What's the story coming out of it? Because like it, it, if you go in with an idea of what your documentary is going to be about, and you always come out with something different. So when you look for documentaries today, something that you would like to watch, um, what for you, what do you look for, and what, what for you makes a good documentary story good? That it's a complete story. That it's a complete good, story. That it has compelling characters. And it, it the reason... Just like a narrative movie. Ju- it's it's just like a narrative. It's, it's you know, narr- narrative is really copying life, right? And yeah. we're just... You're just making sense. You're compressing time and making sense out of real life. You're putting it True. into a nice package. You know, there's so many moments that are... are the moments between when things happen. So you're compressing it, but you're making sense out of things don't, that don't na- necessarily happen linearly. So you have to create sense out of the real story, and that it, when it becomes a documentary, you're creatively treating the truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have been talking for some period of time yeah, here. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we're going to 
go to the last two questions that I ask everybody. And the first is, in all of your long experiences, whether at Nat Geo or here at to Point Park or wherever, um, can you do you have a, a quirky, funny, offbeat, oddball story that you might be able to share with us? Um, yeah, so I hit on the filming something in uh, Australia or a little bit earlier. Um, I went into the Northern Territories, into Arnhem Land, to work on a film for the Pew Environmental Trust and the Nature Conservancy. Um, about prescribed burns, about controlled burns in the Northern Territories. The Prime Minister of Australia had just given lands... Burns of, of the forest? Burns of the forest. forest. G- they'd just given land back to the um, Aborigines that they had taken. And it, enough time had passed where the, the elders knew how to control the burns and control the land so that the, they, these are controlled burns so that They don't have forest fires. They don't have uncontrolled burns. So we went in to make this film, and we were meeting this um, ecologist that um, works in Australia. So I went in with full faith, you know, oh, we're on an adventure, that full faith that we would be taken care of. Well, what happened, it was a series of of events. Um, Within Kakadu National Park, where we had to travel through, Uranium mining had had just started again, so all of the rental vehicles that w- that were acceptable for driving hours into the bush of Australia were rented by the miners, and we couldn't get you know a big giant Range Rover. We ended up with basically a, a consumer um, four wheel drive Nissan mm-hmm. that had a snorkel because we were going to be driving through rivers um, to get to. Um, deep into the bush well quickly realized that we were not in the right vehicle as this guy is driving us deeper and deeper into and you're seeing crocodiles in the river you're seeing you know everything in australia can kill you and i you know easter island there's nothing there that's going to hurt you except you know you could trip on one of the volcanic rocks here he's driving and driving and driving and the vehicle completely gets trapped in the sand Mm. And so I made the assumption that he's been here before he's done this a million times. Okay, let's get the shovels and let's start digging out the vehicle. There was no shovel. The only water in the vehicle was the bottle of water that I had brought with me and had to share with the other two people. So we were on our hands and knees digging the vehicle out. And you were how far from civilization? Oh, hours. 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 Right. And then once we dug it, we were filthy head to toe. And I'm going into camping thinking I'm not going to be able to bathe. I'm going to be in there for a week covered in dirt from head Mm. to toe. like In in your ears and your nose, everywhere. Because we were on our... On our hands and knees like a dog digging the vehicle out of, right. of the sand. So, and then we continue driving through these rivers. And I'm going, this vehicle is not safe for this. Like, it, I mean, it had the snorkel, meaning the exhaust was, was higher up. But, um, you know, I was spent the rest of the time completely terrified that the vehicle was going to stall out in a river. And that we would have to wade out of the river with these giant Australian crocodiles. Mm, that'd be fun. So, and then go where? So it was one of the most terrifying moments. So it's like the minute that, that radar, it's like, make sure you're going to be safe and make sure you know where you're going. Right. In the end, we were fine. But it was terrifying. Was this in the day or at night? It was in, during the day. During the day. So you during, at least had that opportunity. Yeah, we had, you at know. At night would just be terrifying. Terrifying. I, I didn't look at a map. I didn't really know where we were going. And, you know, it was one of the things. Like, I had been on so many of these little excursions and adventures. I just trusted it would be fine. And it was not. That is the big difference between you and me. <laughs> I have to map everything out in advance. I got to know where I'm going. You just go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what makes you a good documentary filmmaker and me not so much. <laughs> the curiosity helps too. Of course it well that I have. But yeah. the, but but it's the it's the not knowing where I'm going that sometimes gets me. So all right, last question. Do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip for anyone who's either trying to make their way into this world that you've been through or is in it and trying to get to the next level? Yeah, it's and it's not about practical filmmaking, it's about learning how to negotiate really um negotiate you know you this 
documentary is so exciting and for me money has never been a motivating factor to be in this field fortunately the side effect of the hard work i've done is some money to live on right well i think that's a good thing because most documentaries don't make any money yeah. it's a rare exception <laughs> I know. it's um yeah i've 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 been really really lucky and and um maybe a little clever in positioning myself on on how to make a living doing this um, and, you know, and lately been making a living as a professor. So that, that's been fun that's as well. That's a little more steady and regular. Yeah, it is, it, it's, a, it's a nice, solid foundation. But it's, it's negotiation skills. And, you know, narrative, documentary, you, you have to learn. And it's very, very hard to learn this. I don't, some people are natural negotiators. But to learn and to force and to be able to convince people that your work has value. You're usually so desperate for somebody to air your piece if you make a, a documentary short, Caballo Loco on Easter Island, National Geographic aired it. They they did a, a five or six minute cut of my twenty five minute film and aired it on on um, Wild Chronicles. Sixty four hours down to five <laughs> to minutes. Five minutes, yeah. I mean the the essence of the film, <laughs> and I didn't negotiate properly. I spent a lot of time and a lot of years of my life. You, you, you so you mean you, you didn't negotiate the deal? The deal? No, I didn't. I didn't get paid what that piece was. But worth. that word negotiation is important because um, you didn't. Ju- it's not just about negotiating a deal. It's negotiating with your subjects. It's negotiating with the uh, people who you're trying to get something from while you're getting ready to shoot. It's all those negotiations. I would say as a producer, that's one of the biggest things that you have to have in your bag of tricks is how do you negotiate with people uh, right. on, on all sorts of things. Right. So it's not just about negotiating your deal. It's negotiating your way. It's, it's Your way in. It's being out in the middle of nowhere and on your hands digging the dirt out from the vehicle and figuring out how to negotiate your way out of that. If there's, so the word negotiation has different connotations. <laughs> right. But, but I, I, that's a, that's, uh, um, in all the episodes of, uh, we've done on Storybeat, that's the first time anybody's used that word in this way as, a, as a, a piece of advice, which I think is just very valuable. So I'm very glad you said it because it is for someone who's in the business, if you're a screenwriter, if you're a director, if you're a producer, you have to know how to negotiate with people to get what you need, Right. Exactly. Not just deal making, though that's really critical too. You need to learn that. So I would say learn how to negotiate, how to get what you want. Laura, this has been fantastic fun. Thank you so much for coming on Storybeat today. Thanks so much, Steve. It's been great fun for me as well. It's been just great to have you. So thank you very much. And so we've come to the end of today's Storybeat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.